Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us someone who needs no introduction and someone who has better things to do this time, but still he decided to be generous enough to join us this week. We have the man himself, Mr. Glenn Beck. Glenn, thank you so much for joining me. Seriously, it's a big honor. Michael, I just had to be on because I'm not sure how your your seating situation is working because it really looks to me like you're sitting on the floor like your chair has no wheels you're so short your chair has no wheels you just crawl up into the seat and you're sitting on the floor so are you going to tell us what the 11th urban spice is is it paprika oh oh really we're headed there right now <laughs> you want, you want okay. to, do you know what's on uh, the floor it's literally alexandra hamilton's autograph on the floor and to my left is Robespierre's autograph. Like, this is what a disaster my house is. Wow. But you're, you're a big collector as well. Yeah. You're a big Wizard of Oz fan. What are some of the coolest things, before we get serious, what are some of the coolest things that you have in your collection? Um, I just, I'll tell you two things I just uh, bought. I just bought uh, the uh, A-camera clapboard from Jaws. Oh, wow. The, okay. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I just acquired... Um, uh, the American Comedy Award for, um, oh gosh, Mel Brooks, his partner, Blazing Saddles, Blazing Saddles. And, no, no, no. Um, oh my gosh, he just died. I can't believe I, I can't do it. Did Mary Tyler Moore show? Did The Princess Bride? Oh, did... Ted Knight. Oh good God, no, forget it. It's not that important. <laughs> so you're apparently you're a big Joe Biden fan, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You know, my boss, the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> Pudding. Let me get a little bit serious, because was it Russell Brand I saw you do an interview with uh, a few years back? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what you saw. Well, there, was an interview I, I, there was an interview I saw. I forgot who was with. It was someone I wouldn't expect you to do an interview with. And you were talking about the George W. Bush administration. And I remember you were choosing your words very carefully. And the impression I got, and this is why I want to you know, hear your thoughts, it felt to me like you were saying that you had been manipulated during those years and that you felt bad about it. Did I get the right impression from that interview? Yes and no. I, first of all, I've never had a president. I've never had a president who liked me. You okay. know? I'm, I'm always one of, I'm, I'm never at the cool kids table. And, uh, and, uh, it's because I'm honest. I don't, I don't really care. Um, and you know, if you say one thing and do another, then, you know, I'm going to point it out and I'm not going to play politics with it. I thought George Bush, uh, you know, he's, he's too much of a globalist for me. Um, you know, I think he was, uh, I, I appreciated hit the idea of what I think we were trying to do in Afghanistan and in Iraq, um, but we didn't do it right. We should have been gone um, quickly out of that. You know, this nation building stuff has got to stop. The ghost planing of people. If you're going to torture, have the balls to say, yeah, we're going to torture. Otherwise, don't torture. Um, I mean, we, we just, nobody ever knows who we are because we're not, the United States government I don't think is reflective of what the people think. Um, and uh, they don't, they don't represent us uh, far as I think if you went into, you know, and did a focus group just on common sense stuff, <clears throat> we would not sound like they sound in Washington. No. And I'm just kind of sick of it because I don't think the, uh, the politicians listen to us. I think they lie to us all the time and, uh, and they're destroying what America really could be, and maybe partially has been, uh, and what we hope it could be. Um, I, I'm sure you were following the recent story of uh, Jonah Goldberg and Stephen Hayes uh, leaving Fox News. You obviously left Fox many years ago to very successfully found The Blaze, uh, which is a thriving network. What was your reaction to their kind of leaving in, on such bad terms? I have to tell you, I didn't follow it. Oh, wow. Talk, but I didn't follow it. Tell me, fill me in. Well, well, basically, Joan and Stephen Hayes said Fox has become like a propaganda machine, that they're not holding Trump accountable, uh, that they're full of crap. Fox is saying, 
we're, we weren't going to renew your contract anyway. You guys are a couple of dinosaurs. No one cares what you think. Tucker Carlson especially went very hard in the paint against them and said, you know, you guys are just butthurt that no one's giving you attention and that you're a relic of, you know, years gone by. So Joan Goldberg has been a friend of mine. Um, we disagree a lot on a lot of things now, but I think he's done a lot to expose the uh, progressive agenda. Sure. Um, he kind of went off the, the rails, um, I think, with Trump. I, I just don't, I don't trust, I don't trust anybody, anybody that can't say something good about the policy of Donald Trump. You know, and and especially a Republican. He, that guy did more more stuff that everybody promised that they never did than any other president in my lifetime. Um, and you know, if you can't say, you know, it's like talking to somebody and they say, "Oh, I hate McDonald's. Everything's horrible at McDonald's." And you're like, "Really? The fries? Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, horrible." Yeah. And if they can't say, "Well, okay, the fries," then you have no credibility. And um, uh, I think a lot of people went off the deep end on both in both directions with Donald Trump uh, instead of letting the chips fall where they may. Um, and when it comes to Fox, I, I don't I don't trust them either. I mean, I, uh, you know, I have no idea what it's like there now. I was there with Roger Ailes and it was a uh, fascinating at times uh exhilarating because it was the top of the craft uh and a lot of times very spooky almost movie like spooky um i'm gonna ask you a softball question but it's i think this is something people interest will be interested in everyone at the blaze loves working there in fact i've met many people who used to work for you and they all say you're really nice and you care about your employees yes. <laughs> really big um, I, uh, I threaten them with attorneys if they leave here they have to say that no it's but it, that. but that, i mean fox did not have that vibe uh there was a lot of paranoia there not unwarranted people were picking you know everyone wanted to be the top dog it was much more of a public facing organization bigger than the blaze is this something you did consciously to be like i'm going to create an environment or is this just a, like your personality no i used to be a monster um, you know, when I was younger, uh, you know, I was successful when I was really young. And if you, you know, if you're, if you're really successful in your twenties, you have a good shot of, of becoming a monster. Cause you don't, you know, you just buy into your own crap. Luckily I bottomed out and, you know, I'm an alcoholic recovering, um, no, um, but recovering, <laughs> recovering alcoholic. And, uh, that made me really reevaluate everything and, uh, I knew that my word was the most important thing. That's the only thing you own in yeah, yeah. is your integrity and your word. So I really wanted to do that. And I also, I like people and I like working with people. And I like, um, I, I, I hire people who think differently than I do. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, and I don't want a bunch of people in lockstep with me. I like yeah, really yeah. different thinkers. And so when I hire people, I, I like them uh, and for different reasons. And some people will say, why are they here? Because th it's a really important thing. I, they have a skill that I don't have or a take that I don't have. And I am not the guy who should be in talk radio. You know, I started talk radio um, really to make fun of talk radio because I thought it was just so pompous. Um, and uh, I did comedy for the first four years of the show. Um, and that kind of went away because when I went to Fox, they yeah, printed yeah. everything I said as a joke, as serious. Um, and, um, and so, you know, when we were um, first starting out, I'm not the guy who likes conflict, even today. I avoid conflict in my real life like crazy. I don't like it on the air. I just don't like it. And I also worked for companies my whole life that treated talent like garbage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and some talent, you know, they don't get it. Um, they, don't, they, don't, they won't recognize this is a business as well as an art form. 
Um, and so, you know, we just don't hire those kind of people. But the people who really get it, leave them alone, man. Create a happy atmosphere. Be a be a place that embraces new ideas and different people and and uh, different ways of doing things, because you'll all be successful then. Um, what? So whenever the the a party is out of the White House, there's always kind of this soul searching. What are we about? What do we stand for? Do we go more towards our base to regain the White House? Do we go towards more the center? Is that going to be more electable? Where do you think the Republican Party stands today? It seems to be a crossroads. And where would you see, would like to see them going heading into the midterms? Uh, I see them. I mean, they're already in hell, so I don't know where else they could go. That would be a, maybe the second level of hell. <laughs> um, they're, I mean, I don't trust them. I don't like them. I don't think they like me. I don't think they like the audience. I don't think they like their supporters. You know, I think some do. Some of them are really good. Um, uh, I saw Dan Crenshaw say that uh, the Freedom Caucus is is uh, filled with a bunch of uh, what did he call them? Grifters. Grifters. He's a grifters. Yeah. What are you talking about? Um, I think these are some of the only guys that are actually standing up for things that I care about. Um, do you know, you know why? Can I interrupt you? Do you know why I think he said that? No, I can reverse engineer it. So Crenshaw is very big on social media and he runs his own account. And it's not that hard for someone of his stature to get goaded into a response. And a lot of the hate he gets on Twitter clearly gets under his skin. Number one. Number two is grifter is one of those terms du jour, like incel, that is used as a pejorative on Twitter without people realizing what the meaning is. For example, Trump is often called an incel. And it's like, what do you think this term means? Doesn't mean jerk. It means someone who's involuntarily celibate. So he very clearly, in my opinion, just took that word grifter from the social media zeitgeist and just means it just to him, it means jerk. But what's the grift? I mean, every politician on some level is a grifter. They're saying, you know, if you vote me in, I'm going to deliver these, these the policies. And then it's like, whoops, you know, Kevin McCarthy said different. So maybe next year. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's the way I look at the entire Republican Party. Um, but I don't, there are, th- there are those in the Freedom Caucus that I think um, are very different than that. Look, here's, here's where I, th- I think the Republicans, I wouldn't even call them that. Here's where I, th- here's where I would, what I'd like to happen. If you remember in 1853, 54, uh, Charles Sumner stood up uh, in the well of the Senate and said, I don't believe either of you guys. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe the Whigs and I don't believe the Democrats. Neither of you want to stop slavery. Oh, you'll talk about it, but it's not true. You're both sleeping with the whore of slavery. And he was almost beaten to death by a congressman um, in the well of the Senate. That gave birth to the Republican Party. And I have been talking to so many people in the Republican Party that I think care about the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, because that's really all I care about. All of our problems are solved if we go back to the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and limit the government. Um, And uh, I've just been talking to the guy saying, when will one of you guys stand up and say, none of you people in my party are serious and none of you people in the other party are serious? Uh, I don't want I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Uh, me and these few Democrats and these few Republicans, we're going to do something different. We're actually going to protect and defend the Constitution because that's really what's under attack here. And just be just be, you know, common sense libertarians. Libertarians, uh, I, I'm a I'm a. Um, I guess I would call myself a reverse progressive libertarian. Uh, it's taken us it's taken us a hundred years to get people to think that they don't have rights or responsibilities. It's going to take us some time to get back the other direction. So let's slowly reverse engineer this. You know, instead of saying "Hey, hookers for everybody" on Tuesday, let's slow down on some of the things. Um, and do common sense. I mean, you can look at the drug policies of uh, Portugal. Those make complete sense. And I think America is ready for for things like that. 
Um, but the parties are just all screwed up, and, and I don't trust anybody in the Republican Party. Hey, guys. Michael Malice here. Let me talk to you about probably my favorite sponsor because they're always near to dear to a certain part of me, which is Sheath Underwear. Mm-hmm. If you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code Malice, you get 20% off, and you get to support the underwear that supports you. What makes Sheath so unique? Well, it was developed by the CEO, Bobby, because he spent time in Iraq. And let me tell you, it gets very hot over there, day after day of triple digit heat, and you get chafing and you get discomfort. Sheath is the most comfortable underwear you're ever going to wear. And what makes them even more special, their dual pouch technology, one part of your boys, another part for your other boys. They also have a women's line, but since no women watch this show, we can skip that part. I wear sheath every day. I'm proud to be a sheath underwear model. And I'm, the first time I put them on, I'm like, what the heck is this? I said, heck. And now I'm like, I can't imagine wearing any other underwear. If you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code malice, you get 20% off and you could try their new bamboo ones. And they've won ones that look like the matrix. Really cool stuff. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. I want to talk to you about a sponsor that I think is doing really terrific work. And that's Fume, F-U-M. Fume is the number one natural way to quit smoking. You get a fume, which kind of looks like a steampunk vape, and then you have these plant pack cores that you fray and stick in the other end. You're going to be wearing, using them at a party, after a club, whatever. You're like, what is that? Oh, this? This is my fume. You're going to save a lot of money because you're not buying cigarettes. You're not buying vape juice. You have that ritual motion of smoking without any of the harmful side effects. No smoke, no vape, no nicotine, no harmful chemicals. And you've got flavors that taste great and work to curb cravings, ease stress, and speak correctly and improve breathing. They've got a new holiday pack uh, with, made out of olive wood. It looks really cool, marbled and pretty. They're handmade in Canada. I love this stuff. If, here's the thing. If you go to breathefume.com, B-R-E-A-T-H-E-F-U-M.com slash malice, 10, you get 10% off. Can't remember that? Just use promo code MALICE and you get 10% off your order. Fume has saved lots of lives because I'm telling you guys, smoking is pretty much the worst habit you could have for your health other than listening to this terrible show. And this is a great way to take control of your health back. And all it takes is just going to breathefume.com slash MALICE10 and get started back on that road to having clean lungs. Let's get back to the show. So during the 2000s, you were very critical of Congressman Ron Paul. Now you're just describing yourself as a libertarian. Do you still stand by the criticism or do you think Ron Paul had it right? No, I think Ron Paul had it right. My problem, I think, with Ron Paul, it's been so long, I don't know. If you have any quotes, you can ask me. No, I, I'm not trying to play God. I just mean no, no, like, no, what, I know that. What, no, 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 what I you, know that. What is your view of Ron Paul now? Like, let's just put it that my, way. My view of Ron Paul is that Ron Paul was right on a lot of stuff, um, but he would always um, say one thing and, the, and then put all of the pork in the bills that he wanted for his district, and then he just wouldn't vote for the bill because, oh, it's got pork in it, and then he'd still get the pork, and he'd get the credit for not, you know, involved in that. And he was involved in that. So I felt that there was a game going on with him on that. But I thought, I've always thought that the, um, the basic ideas of libertarianism, that chair was taken from the table by the progressives. Um, And we got progressive light, the Republicans, and then progressive leaning communist from the Democrats. How much of an influence was Rush Limbaugh on you and your career? It's funny because I, I listened to Rush Limbaugh for years uh, when I was in talk radio, but I didn't like politics. I still don't like politics. Um, and so I, I wasn't like a, a zombie fan. I, if I was in my car and it was midday, I'd turn him on. And I thought he was uh an innovator and remarkable entertainer he was a radio guy before he was a political guy yeah um and i like i really appreciate people who understand the craft you know um people now i mean it's going to be a lost art form um but there is there is something to someone who knows 
where to position a microphone and how to move around it to create different feelings and sounds and everything else. And I really appreciated Rush for um, his entertainment ability. Also, because at that time, nobody was saying those things on the air. Right. Nobody. And he completely broke new ground. He saved AM radio. Um, and he created talk radio. He created satellite talk radio. Uh, so I owe much of my career to Rush Limbaugh. Uh, you very famously were not at all in favor of candidate Donald Trump. Uh, you're a Ted Cruz guy. You changed your perspective. Of what, both of them. Uh, so what's weird, of both of them. Let's talk about those. What made you yeah. change your opinion on Trump? And where did it go from? And where did it end up? And then we could talk about Senator Ted Cruz as well. Uh, so it went from this guy is possibly the devil. Um, okay. You know, I mean, I, I don't think there was a stronger voice against him. Um, at least in conservative, uh, the conservative world. And uh, I really, truly believed this guy uh, was a grifter, <laughs> that, you know, uh, he was going to get in. He's a New York liberal. Yeah. Oh, he's I gonna, see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to get in. He's saying one thing, but he is. And I think there's a chance that if the Democrats would have played their hand entirely differently, I think they could have gotten some of the candy they wanted uh, on their agenda. Because he's, well. he's a deal maker. He's a deal maker. Yeah. Um, but they played their hand so poorly. There was no, he wasn't going to give them anything. Um, and they made it much more, much worse for them and made it much better. When, when I watched him on his policies, like I am not, I'm a free trade guy. I do not like trade barriers. However, when it comes to China, they are so engaged in evil crap. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it is the, it's the Nazi regime now of our, of our generation. The stuff they're doing and the things we're buying from China that are made by people in concentration camps. What are we doing? I actually appreciated his trade barrier with China. Um, and that's the first time I think I've ever been for a trade barrier. Um, and then I watched him and when he pulled the trigger on Jerusalem and he said it will be open, what, six months from now or whatever it was, I was astounded, astounded, because that showed to me a guy who believed in something, said he would do it, and then did what even the bravest presidents since Harry Truman have refused to do. They've all promised it, but they've refused to do it. And that showed me he understands he's in charge of the State Department, yeah. not the other way around. Now, that, was, that was the real turning point for me. Now, Ted Cruz, it seems like you're saying that your opinion of him lessened. At the time, I mean, uh, Ted is, um, I didn't understand at the end with Ted when he, he wouldn't endorse him at the the GOP, but then I can't remember exactly how this happened, but I know that Ted, cause I was with Ted. I know that Ted was like, this guy's, he's lying about my family. I mean, my dad is now the killer of JFK. I mean, this is insanity. And then I think he didn't endorse Trump at the convention. And then like a week later, two weeks later, then endorsed him. And I thought, this is just the craziest. I don't even know what you're thinking. I don't even know what you're thinking. Um, but you know, Ted's done some good things in Congress and it's really Mike Lee and Ted Cruz, the reason why we have the Supreme court justices that I hope we have. Um, <laughs> who is your guy for 2024? Do you think Ron DeSantis is really going to be the savior of the Republican party? I am going to sit down with Donald Trump on Friday for an interview that will air. In oh, wow. Yeah. And I, I want to get a set. I can guarantee you he's going to run. Uh, oh, really? Oh, yeah. The, let yeah. me say why I was surprised and please educate me. I would my guess would have been he wouldn't run because he wouldn't want to go through that gauntlet again because there's enough of the base that would want to repudiate him. So I could be completely wrong. So please tell me why that's wrong. Um, it's Donald Trump. OK, uh, he he is not going to go 
uh, out quietly with an L in the column. Okay. In the column. Um, he is, uh, uh, I mean, look at the support in the Republican base, even though a lot of people I talk to um, say, you know, I like him, like his policies and everything, but I just don't want to go through that again with yeah. the left. And, you know, how is he going? And this is one of my questions for him. How are you going to expand your base? Because you can't just right. keep running with half the country. And I, I, that's the one thing I think DeSantis can, can do is expand the base and have eight years and not four. You cannot fix this problem with four years. But if we had Trump and then DeSantis, DeSantis, we could really right this ship if DeSantis is the guy he seems to be. But it takes balls of steel to do what Donald Trump did. I mean, I don't think people can really appreciate there was nothing that was going to stop this guy. Um, and I really disagreed with people who said, we just need to burn the whole system down. No, no, you know, the system uh, has some good things, Bill of Rights, general structure, it needs to be revamped and cleaned out, and maybe everybody needs to be fired, and we need to close most of it down, but let's not burn it down, that doesn't usually lead to things other than Robespierre, um, sorry if you're a fan of Robespierre. I am not a fan of Robespierre. Okay, um, but I, I will tell you that Donald Trump I am more in line with someone who will come in and just throw hand grenades into rooms and just see what scampers out. You know, that's it. Well, I like this idea. We shouldn't burn it down. We should just explode it. Yeah, I know. No, I said, <laughs> I said that's I where I fire. was. I want grenades. That's right. That. Well, here's the thing. And this is where I really became convinced that he is, he's, it, there's good damage being done here. When the Ukraine thing was going on and he was defending himself on this phone call that was not the perfect phone call. Perfect shouldn't phone have, call. We all heard yeah, it. It's a perfect. OK, we can all go. That probably wasn't so perfect. Yeah. But there was nothing wrong with it, but it probably wasn't so perfect. Um, but when he threw that grenade into uh, or when he made that phone call, he started throwing grenades uh, out about Ukraine. And he blew a wall. It's almost like the Wizard of Oz when it's like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Yeah. All of a sudden, that curtain was gone. And you're like, wait a minute. What are those guys doing? And you saw the machine that they had built. And they were not going to let go. Um, you know, this great reset nonsense. I'm convinced that one of the reasons this happened with Donald Trump is because there was a succession and and we know the players and nobody's going to upset this apple cart. And so we're moving in this direction. Donald Trump wasn't going to play that game because he is actually America first. Um, and that won't go with the Davos people. That won't go with the Great Reset. And I think that they knew everything we've worked for it could be blown up and be yeah. no good if this guy continues. We got to stop him. Are you surprised at all that both uh, Governor Cuomo is out in New York State, possibly facing criminal charges, and his brother Chris Cuomo is out very publicly at CNN? I think it's a good thing. I don't know what I mean. I, I, you know, the the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. I look at these things as good steps in the right direction, that the system is kind of working. Um, where I didn't have, I mean, even when we met, how long ago was that? Just a couple of weeks, it was like last month. Yeah, so Michael said, you know, when I met with you, I think I may have been really depressing. Yeah, yeah, uh, you yeah. thought it's done. Yeah, it's done. In the last couple of weeks, I've kind of had uh, a change of heart that, I see people standing up and it's more than just, you know, people that listen to me or, you know, whatever. It's people that don't agree with me, but are now agreeing on the same problem. 
and they're seeing the problem and it's not what a politician is saying. They're going, hmm, something is not right there and we're being lied to by this person, this person, and this person. We should limit that. Uh, and that's a good thing. And people are just starting, courage is contagious. And a year ago, I saw only one guy that was willing to destroy himself, his fortune, and his family, and that was Donald Trump. Um, and it's going to take a lot more of us. If you're going to stand up, you have to be like, I don't care. I don't yeah, care. Yeah, right. You know, I'll lose. Oh, I lost my job. Oh, no. I'll find a way to survive. Oh, you, oh you're oh, you running me through the mud and calling me all kinds of names. Well, I know who I am. Um, and some, some of us are going to lose big time, but we have to be willing to do it if we really want freedom. Do you know what I think it is? I think they, they very publicly went after people's kids. And when you yes. start telling parents, it's you don't have a right to tell me how to educate your kids and telling you, well, we don't teach critical race theory. True. We just put the critical race theory concepts in the classroom. Correct. It, 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 and, and then like you, the eye roll is absolutely correct because the parents like, who yeah. are you fooling here? Like I can yeah. see the curriculum. I see what you're teaching them. I don't care what you call it. You could call it happy fun land. It's still a problem. When you do that and do it very publicly, that's when it, you don't have to be Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're coming between me and my kids. We have a real right. problem. And I think you have, I think you have that happening over and over again. I mean, Biden is so bad that there is the policies are just so bad that, you know, with, with, with Barack Obama, I could disagree with the policies and I could disagree with the people and say, look where they're taking us. Um, but you still could go, well, you know, but there are some people that would say this is a really good thing and this is providing health care or whatever. Almost everything Joe Biden has done has blown up on the launch pad, uh, on the launch pad. I can't think of a single thing that he has done that I would say is a win for the American people. Um, and everybody knows it, you know, um, our economy, uh, you know, little inflation, but it's transitory. Everybody who's buying meat yeah, yeah, right yeah. now goes, come on, man. Oh, uh, the gasoline shortage. I'm talking to OPEC. We were just energy independent. And the first thing you did were close down all the pipelines. I know who made my gas go up. Yeah. And there just doesn't seem to be the traction that the press had a year ago. People are waking up going, you guys are all full of crap. You ever feel like you're being followed around the internet and advertisers know a bit too much about you? So our sponsor, IP Vanish VPN, helps you take back your privacy and helps you become anonymous on the internet. So IP Vanish is a virtual private network. That's VPN for short. It's an important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. You can use it on your phone, tablet, computer, wherever you're streaming media. And when you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted, which means what you're searching, what you're watching, what you're reading, whatever you're doing, because what you're doing on the internet is it anyone's business but yours? And for listeners of the show, IP Vanish is offering 65% off their annual plan. It's only three seventy-five dollars a month. Super easy to use. Turn off one click and it runs in the background helping to protect you while you're browsing the web. All you got to do is you go to ipvanish.com slash malice, use promo code malice, and you get 65% off. Their annual plan is just $44.99 for the first year with our exclusive discount. This is the time to sign up because with our discount and their current promotion, you get a VPN for 65% off the usual offering. More good news, IP Vanish is the best of the best. They've got a 4.7 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot with over 6,000 reviews. All you got to do is go to ipvanish.com slash malice to get the deal and start reclaiming your online privacy. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. We all want to make sure our family's protected in a medical emergency, but what many of us don't realize health insurance won't always cover the full amount of an emergency medical flight. So even if you have comprehensive coverage, you get hit with high deductibles and copays. That is why an Air Medicare Network membership is so important. As a member, if an emergency arises, you will not see a bill for air medical transport when flown by an AMCN provider. And best of all, a membership covers your entire household for as little as $85 a year. AMCN providers are called upon to transport more than 100,000 patients a year. This is coverage no family should be without. And as a listener of our show, you'll get up to a $50 e-gift card with a new membership. All you got to do is go to airmedcarenetwork.com slash malice. 
and use offer code malice. Let's get back to the show. Yeah. And I think it also harkens back to Jimmy Carter's Malay speech when it was a similar situation in the late 70s. Uh, gas prices were expensive. There wasn't enough money for electricity. And the argument was, well, you should want less and then you'll be more satisfied. Correct. And the American people are like, wait a minute, why am I wanting less when I'm in this rut because of you and your dumb policies right. where this is America, I can work more and get more as opposed to I'm working yep. more and now I can't put meat on the table. That doesn't make sense to me. And that's not even an ideological perspective. Right. And there is a, there is a difference because, again, it's not an ideological perspective. Um, I'm a guy. I mean, I'm a guy. Carl Reiner. That's who the American Comedy Award is for. Uh, uh, it's just you don't want to be in my mind. Pal. It, it's still in the ear, <laughs> earbud. Carl Reiner. What? Oh, I don't have what? any earbuds. <laughs> what? What? Let's uh, do. Um, uh, what were we talking about now uh, before this? We were talking about uh, not it not being an ideological thing about Carter and oh, the Malays perspectives yeah. of Malays. So there is. Th- I'm a guy who can can have Carl Reiner's American Comedy Award and Steven Spielberg's clapboard. So I don't really, I'm not struggling here. Right. And, uh, and I'm a guy who obviously has things to excess. Yeah. However, I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I am preserving these things. This is how I justify things in my head. I'm preserving, you've seen my museum, I'm preserving these things and I get joy out of being around them. Yeah. Um, but, but we are such a disposable society in this way. I love Apple and I love Apple, the way apples are, uh, are made. You can't open it. And it's supposedly beautiful inside. I don't know. It might look like barf inside, but I like the idea that it's craftsmanship and it's, you know, but I don't like the idea that it's made by slaves yeah. and we all know it and we don't care. And I'm preaching it, but I've got a stupid Apple iPad. <laughs> okay. You know, there, there's something grotesque about it, but I don't know how to solve it. That has to be a personal thing. And when you say to me, wear a sweater, shop less, expect less, don't buy such a big house. The American spirit has always been screw you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But I think it's good because it's what it's saying is I'm an individual and I get to choose. Yeah. And there can be some. I mean, look at Donald Trump. I'm going to do this interview in his ballroom, and <laughs> and I want to say to him, Do you have anything? that doesn't have solid gold le- is your bathroom have gold in it he does he has a gold you know he has a gold toilet i'm not joking oh yeah i, I believe it yeah yeah um you know so but that's him and that's fine i don't slight him for it i'm yeah, tired not, of these is people it, telling- is it fine it's tacky as hell oh no it's tacky as hell yeah i yeah. don't want it i don't want to live it um you know uh, but I don't, uh, but my daughter is the exact opposite. She's 30. She's a vegan. Uh, you know, she won't wear, I I'm a rancher and she was like, Oh, this is wrong. But we live next door to each other. We love each other and it's not a problem. And I'd have Donald Trump on the other side. I could have the vegan hippie on one side and Donald Trump on the other, and we'd all be friends. So speaking of friends, so since you and I had our conversation, it's been brought to my attention that Penn Jillette does not regard himself as a libertarian anymore. He endorsed Biden. He has taken photos of himself with Gavin Newsom. Uh, his daughter came out as trans. She's, F, excuse me, son, F to M. Uh, and he doesn't use personal pronouns on his show. Did you not know any of this? No, excuse me, gendered pronouns. So if he's talking to someone in the audience, he won't say, you know, like if they, if they have to pick someone random from the audience, he won't say, okay, him, he'll say them because he's not trying to use gendered language anymore. Again, that's his choice. As long I'm as not saying it's not his Democrat. choice. I'm just saying yeah, I mean, it's, when that, you, you're referring to Penn Jillette libertarians, a Penn Jillette libertarian is a Newsom supporter. Hmm. I, I haven't talked to him in a while. I'll have to talk to him. I mean, I, I have always liked him because um, he's always, he's always growing. 
You know, he's never, he's, this is, this was one of my problems that I had uh, in the, you know, 2000, 2010 era, I think, is that I was certain. And now I'm certain that the only thing I'm certain about is that I'm not certain about anything. And when you're constantly expanding and constantly willing to open your eyes and go, well, now, wait a minute. I mean, that's what I like about Penn. Um, so I'd love to hear about his journey. I'd love to talk to him about his journey there. Cause I bet you it makes sense, at least to him, it will absolutely make sense. And those people, I don't care how you vote those people I can get along with because at least they've thought it through. And I can say that doesn't make any sense for me, but God bless you. And they'll still have an open mind to where. I mean, Michael, I think you're like this. I don't argue things to to win. I don't care. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I don't care if I win or not. I just I want to live in the truth the best that I possibly can understand it at this point. And if somebody brings something up that I strongly disagree with and they make a really good point, I'm going to say really good point. I have to get back to you on that. I don't. I don't know how to answer that. That's a great point. I never thought of it that way. And if it changes my mind, it changes my mind. Yeah. You're dead if it doesn't. Of course. I'd rather learn than win. I'd rather yes. learn something that'll help me through the rest of my life. Yes. I know I, I won this argument. What does that gain me? Nothing. Some Nothing. Little and you know what? Boost of self-esteem. That's, that's what everybody is trying to do. Everybody right now is trying to win. They want to be proven. Their side is right. Your side is wrong. There's no healing from that, that, that just, I mean, what do you do then with the other losers, you know, and we're not, if we believe that we are 100% right, and then there's nothing I can learn from that person. And that's what leads you to things like, I just saw this uh, teacher uh, who is part of the um, teachers union, uh, I think, I can't remember, but she's a a national uh, figure and I just read this this morning where she said, you know, I just think those Republicans should take all those people that have that believe so much in those guns and won't take the vaccine and just shoot them all. It would be less painful and better for the rest of us and our health. And that's the kind of thinking that comes from I don't have anything to lose uh, learn from you. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you yeah. are wrong on everything and i don't even have to listen to you That's yeah insane. you obviously left new york um moved to texas for the blaze i was a lifelong new yorker i moved here to austin over the summer i still don't know how to drive what's it and i feel like i left an abusive relationship because it's the kind of thing where you you're looking back you're like how did i put up with all of this for so long and then yeah. also to tell other people no you just don't understand this just means I'm tough. You can't handle it. And it's like, why am I handling a punch in the mouth every day? This is not commendable to me. So what is your reaction as an ex-New Yorker looking at what's going on in New York City right now? I'm really sad. New York is one of my favorite places. Um, I had a horrible, I had the best experience and the worst experience living in New York, but I think that's New York. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, and to see what it's become and to see where it's going, going, I, I, I don't, uh, I agree with, I think it's Malcolm Gladwell who says it's over um, and it's never coming back. Um, uh, there's a chance that that's, that's true. If they don't get off this path, it's true. Um, and I don't know how much more damage they can do. I'm, I'm glad that- uh, Oh, there's more. Did you not hear what he just said? They're now having the vaccine passport for like kids. So if yeah, you're but, a kid, yeah. But the uh, judge just overruled. Oh, and, thank, okay, good to hear. And okay. you've got a new, you've got a new mayor coming in in January anyway. So. Oh no, he said I'm going to have the exact same proposals. Don't look for change from me. He already tweeted that out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Sorry, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, it's not happening. He's. But the, but the, let's talk a little bit earlier. This circles back to the system. You were saying, you know, let's have some Republicans and Democrats who say you guys are both lying. Uh, you know, we want to return to the Constitution. Isn't it a bit like jury selection? Why would the party have as its nominees and as Congress people? 
people who are independent and aren't going to play the party line. You can't, it's very, very hard unless you're independently wealthy. And even then there's all these hurdles to get your name on the ballot and then to get that seat. Yeah, I think we should have open ballots on everything. What, 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 what would that mean? Uh, it means that um, uh, you want to run, register to run. You don't have to go through the party. You don't have to we get rid of all of these obstacles in the states for people to be able to run. It, it, the whole system, I mean, read George Washington's farewell address. He warns us about everything that's going on right now. And he tells us probably most of it is going to come from the two-party system. It's bad. Run from the two-party system. And we're there. And we see it and we all know it. And they're like, well, it's, you know, it's a binary choice. So I don't like either of those choices. Um, I, I think we just need to get the apparatus uh, of the two party system out of the way when it comes to voting. I, you know, the, the one thing I like about this country and the way it was set up is it was set up for 13 and now 50 experiments. These should all be laboratories for freedom. And, you know, you do something, you know, Mitt Romney, when he did Romney care, I thought it was idiotic, but I didn't argue about it living in another state. Why should I? It's not my state. And if it worked, I would have been for it, but it doesn't work. And uh, what happens is people will just say, okay, well, I can't get it to work here because I need endless amounts of cash. And only the United States government can do that endless amount of cash right. all the time. Um, it, that's why we don't put it there. We should be looking at different systems and different people. And somebody boils up in uh, California that really gets it or Texas that really gets it. But gets it in a way where the Democrats don't want it and the Republicans don't want it. I don't know. We should be able to vote on that person. But the system doesn't want, you know, it, when Reagan won, he was the outsider on the GOP. The GOP, established, oh, yeah. Yeah, they didn't want him. And they saw, just like Donald Trump, he could win and upset all the plans. Well, the Republicans didn't do what the Democrats did. The Democrats went and said, we got to make sure that never happens to us. We'll have super delegates. And that's how they screwed Bernie Sanders. But I honestly wanted Ted Cruz and Bernie Sanders. Let's have the constitutional conversation. Let's decide, are we this or are we that? This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Pettisey. I love hearing people's stories of resilience and grit. This is why I created this podcast. We are very excited to welcome Jim Gaffigan, Yasmin Mohammed, Glenn Beck, Tim Dillon, Abigail Schreier, Jeff Garland, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Sam Harris, Heather Hying, Jonah Goldberg, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Greenwald, Sarah Shahi, Colin Quinn. If there's a culture of victimhood, then let's Tell stories of grit and survival. Subscribe and listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get back to the show. But you, you keep saying, like, we need to go back to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Like, when w was that actually the operating uh, uh, system in America? It seems like they were violating it the second the ink was dry. Yeah, because people are people. Yeah. Um, but you can't. You know, Martin Luther King didn't say, tear it down. You suck. This doesn't work. He said, live up, live up to the standards you set yourself. This could be a great country if you live up to those standards. That's what we should be saying. But we don't, we don't demand standards on anything anymore, on anything. We should be demanding standards. Um, uh, I know that doesn't work with a pure libertarian and in, in more of your philosophy, but I do believe that because men are animals, they're animals, and left right. to their own devices, they are an enemy to everything good. Um, enough of them are. And not everybody goes bad, but uh, when a few go bad, they go really bad, and they will try to destroy everything and control everybody. Um, and so I think we do have to have some 
things that are above man that say, you have a right to free speech. You have a right to these things. And then as men know that it's going to ebb and flow, but we're always trying to move forward. Even if it comes back, good, let's move forward. Let's t- if we take a step back, let's take two or three steps forward, knowing that it's going to always do that because that's man. Yeah, but you specifically just said that there's going to be those few who are malevolent. I agree with you completely. Uh, if there was a majority of people who are evil killers, humanity would not be sustainable. We'd all be right. dead. It has to be a small number, just, you know, just do it looking at history. But politics is what allows those few to magnify their evil on a worldwide scale. It's the perfect so, magnet but- for the worst of us, and especially those sociopaths who know how to pass. So I, I agree with you. Uh, I go to Churchill, it's the worst system, but it's the best one we've got. People say the same thing about religion, that religion, it is, it's this thing that just can control and destroy, and it has in the past, and it will in the future, and what are you doing? Well, you could abolish all religion, but we're currently, the same people who, are, who hate religion are the same ones building a religion of That's social sure. justice and everything else. It doesn't matter what you call it. People will always find themselves doing those kinds of things. So how do we guard people? This is the argument the founders made. How do we chain people down enough to when they get to a position of power that there are so many checks and balances that they are restrained? You can't. Unless right. it's a vigilant people all the time. And I contend you can't do that either. But you got to try. It's the best system that we have. Honestly, Michael, if somebody could, you know, we haven't talked about it enough. But if you and I sat down and you, you said, Glenn, this is the plan. This is what it is. This is how it works. And I believed it. I don't... I I love America because I think it's the best way to keep people free. Um, I don't love America because it's America. I love it because of the Bill of Rights and what we can do if we set our mind to it. If somebody comes up with a better plan, I'm out. I'm in yours. Don't you think it's the principles behind the Bill of Rights that are more important than the Bill of Rights itself? Okay. Yes. Um. You, I wouldn't bring this up, but but you opened the conversation earlier. You mentioned that you are in recovery, a recovering alcoholic. What was your rock bottom? And if you don't want to talk about this, we can. What, the, what the hell are you bringing that up for? <laughs> um, uh, my rock bottom was when I lied to my sweet two little girls. Um, Ooh, I used that's to, a big one. Yeah, I I used to tell them stories every night, and. Um, and uh, they were the stories of the adventures of Inky, Blinky, and Stinky, three little mice that uh, would go to the island of cheese where it snowed mozzarella cheese or Parmesan cheese. And, um, and I'd make these stories up every night. And one day the girls, and, and I was drunk all the time, but I was a very high-functioning alcoholic. And um, the girls came down for breakfast and they said, Dad, 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 you got to tell us the last night's story of Inky, Blinky, and Stinky. It was so good. And I realized I not only didn't remember Inky, Blinky, and Stinky, I didn't even remember putting them to bed. And it was, uh, I mean, I'd really struggled with it for probably three, four years and just couldn't stop. And I was just, I was really in a dark place. And um, I sat there and I, I lied to them and I said, I know it was great, wasn't it? But let's see how much you remember. You oh, tell wow. the story back to me. And I don't even remember what they said. I just remember looking at them and just thinking, what the hell am I doing? This has got to stop. And uh, that night I went to an AA meeting. That's wonderful. I mean, what adv- one of the issues that a lot of people have about, I have many friends who are in recovery. I, 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 they're really commended. I think they should all die. I think they should, we should let them die. They're wor- you know who they are? They're worse than people 
that uh, won't get a COVID booster shot. That's how bad they are. Well, that's true because my friends are real garbage human beings. <laughs> so it's like you, sh- you should be drinking yourself to death. Make the world a favor. <laughs> um, but one of the issues that people often have in terms of getting sober is the guilt. Uh, because it's like, once you stop having that alcohol as a crutch, you look back at like all the things you did wrong. I don't drink either. I'm not an alcoholic. I don't drink because when I drink, I get meaner. And then I'm saying very funny, but very cruel things. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I'm like, that person didn't deserve that. Yeah. I got to laugh, but that was nasty. And I don't like myself. I'm trying to think of the difference between you sober then and drunk. It's it's because the jokes are more hurtful than they are humorous. Oh, really? More yeah. hurtful? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Glenn, if you're in recovery, you've been around people who are no, mean drunks, I know. and it's not funny. I know. I was. I, I'm actually the opposite. I'm I'm a nicer guy, um, uh, and just I can. Yeah. Part of the thing was riddled with ADD. Okay. And it will slow me down enough to where I can have conversations and not be processing, you know, 1400 other things at the same time. Um, But the the secret to AA is you're drinking because of something, you know, guilt or something. And so you've got to deal with that or you'll never stay, you'll white knuckle it. You're not sober then. Yeah, you're a dry drunk. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really bad. Um, You also converted to Mormonism. Uh, as an adult, your audience is very heavily what? Why is that funny? I just I just thought that was funny. As an adult, I mean, I mean, I can see kids making that choice, but as an adult, no. But I mean, it's 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 unusual. A somewhat just I want to clarify. It wasn't like your family converted when you guys were kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. Um, your audience is very heavily Christian. Do you ever get heat from traditional Christians, many of whom hardcore Christians regard Mormonism as like a heresy? No, Michael, they don't ever say those things to me. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. In fact, I was with Billy Graham at his house. Billy Graham and I became friends um, probably in the last five years of his life. And I loved him, loved him. Uh, and uh, just a spiritual giant. But, you know, it was his organization that had, you know, Mormons as a demon cult. And uh, uh, I went to visit him and uh, somebody else was there with us who was good friends with him on the first time we met. And uh, he said, uh, so tell me about your relationship with, with Christ and with God. And I started saying something and the person said, well, well, well uh, remember, remember, Billy, he's a Mormon. And he just turned and looked at him. And then he looked at me and he said, you were saying, and I told him, and at the end he was crying and I was crying. And he looked at the other guy and said, he sure sounds Christian to me. And it was that weekend that he actually removed Mormons from the cult status. Oh, that, that, I, that must've made you feel great. It did. It did. Yeah. He was the, you know, I think he might have softened in his, you know, in his older years. He um, he he was one of those guys who just got it and wasn't there to condemn. You know, he 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 said to me, um, uh, "You know, I'm not afraid to die," and we were sitting really close to each other. He said, "I'm not afraid to die." And I could look in his eyes and he was just so clear. Um, and his, his eyes welled up a bit and he said, well, actually, the actual process of dying does <laughs> freak me out. Yeah. <laughs> but I know where I'm going. And he said, and I know my God is a God that will forgive me. He said, everything in my life that I've done wrong, it's because it was me doing it. You know, everything that I got credit for, it was him doing, but the wrong stuff I did, but I did my best. And that's all you have to do is just do your best as you understand it. Well, it's that, that line from recovery, just do the next right thing. Yeah. And if you just do that, you can sleep easy and, and have a good conscience. And it's not, it's not hard conceptually. It's a lot often hard to actually do it because yeah. sometimes doing the right thing is 
you know, you're going to have to say some things you don't want or upset some people, but that's just what it takes to be, you know, a, a good person. What do you want your legacy in terms of politics to be when you're like, I've had enough of this? Sarah, you take over. Politics? <laughs> or just in terms of culture, like or your career, what do you want your legacy to have been? Um, that he wasn't what they said he was. He was actually a decent guy and he tried and he screwed it up at times, but he tried. He, he, I'd love them to give me an honest shake of, yeah, he made mistakes, but he was trying. He did his best with what he had. Yeah. That's all, you know, just a fair shake. Um, I don't think I, I mean, I don't think I'm going to leave a big legacy. <laughs> he was oh my gosh he was remarkable and we should preserve his home i mean i don't think anything's gonna happen you know well i, I think I, you're I wrong think i think your your legacy is the, making the blaze the fact that you're like you don't have to go through these giant conglomerates the fact that you made a home for so many people who are a venn diagram with your views but disagree in some extent you know eric july's there he's great he's an anarchist also he doesn't share the same views as you and that you can create a company where people come together and have these perspectives outside of you know corporate the corporate system i Do think you know that's a big legacy don't you think but what's so weird yeah i guess it is but what's so weird is i think that's supposed to be normal michael Oh, it is, but you did it. You know, it's one thing. I know, somebody... but, I know, but that shouldn't be a big accomplishment. That should just be like, yeah, and he did what everybody's supposed to do. Wait, you don't think uh, creating an independent network that's thriving after all this time is a big accomplishment? I do, because I lived through it. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Um, Glenn, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? This part because I know it's the end and I've passed the little test. We've had a delightful time. And so I say to you, Michael, thank you. You are welcome. Welcome.